Ooh, Star Trek fans are jumping for joy tonight. The Smithsonian Air and Space Museum celebrating the show's 25th anniversary with a major exhibit of Star Trek stuff. And Arch has the scoop. No sugar for those Star Trek fans. They're <laughs> too excited. Anything and everything you ever wanted to know about Star Trek goes on display Friday at Air and Space. Tonight's invitation-only gala featured the entire cast celebrating their enshrinement. To boldly go where no man has gone before. It is the television show that refused to die. Star Trek, canceled in 1969, revived by its fans into a long-term movie franchise. Today, Star Trek entered the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum as a serious, in-depth exhibit featuring costumes, Captain Kirk's chair, even Spock's ears. Let there be no doubt, Star Trek is now a cultural icon. So is the man those ears made famous. I think I discovered that it's not really me, it's Mr. Spock. And, and I, any day now, I expect to see Spock for President bumper stickers <laughs> popping up again. <laughs> Star Trek's creator, Gene Roddenberry, didn't live to see this day at the Smithsonian, but his widow, actress Margell Barrett, did. He wanted to communicate with some intelligent people. And that's why he wrote Star Trek and did it as he did it. So then it became more than just a TV show. It did become an ideal and a vision. The Star Trek exhibit is the first ever non-scientific show by the Air and Space Museum. So far, there are no complaints. And there won't be any either. Uh, the show opens Friday and it's quite uh, terrific. It runs through September. All right. Thanks, Arch. We'll be back in a moment. We're here. You'll see some of the art department's marvelous creations. The largest of these models, which are called miniatures, is, of course, the Starship Enterprise. She's looking very bright and clean. Didn't she always? I ran a very tight ship, as I recall. Most certainly you did, Captain. The model was used in the original series. It has just been restored specially for this exhibition. The smaller version played the Enterprise in the Star Trek feature films. Near them, are models of the shuttlecraft Galileo and the transport ship Botany Bay from the episode Space Seed. In creating a look for Star Trek, Matt Jeffries rejected the familiar cliches of space fiction. The Enterprise is no Buck Rogers rocket ship because it would never enter a planetary atmosphere. Earthbound principles of aerodynamic design could be conveniently ignored. Yet with its long, clean lines and smooth, circular forms, the Starship avoids the ungainliness of a real-life spacecraft such as NASA's spider-like lunar lander, which you can take a look at on your way downstairs after the exhibition. On battle cruiser nasty piece of business that's swift dark and deadly indeed the smaller model was used in the original series note the mysterious geometric patterning that was added to the larger model when it was used as the cruiser called the chronos in star trek 6. keep this detail in mind as you join me at the big case to your right inside the next area of the exhibition another definition of science fiction with the braid on the sleeves stripped of your rank by the dry cleaners pride pomp and the circumstance of glorious war, farewell. I always loved it when they let me quote Shakespeare. Anyway, you can see how the smooth, unadorned shape of the Enterprise is echoed in the simplicity of the Starfleet uniforms. The colors, too, are bright, bold blocks with only the merest suggestion of rank or insignia. While the Klingon uniforms are dark and heavily layered, glittery with sharp-edged metallics and the texture of chain mail. Just as the patterning on the battlecruiser recalls primitive art, in this alien clothing, the idea of personal ornament is made to seem barbaric. The sleek, modest line implies the hero. It's the villain who wears the jewelry. American tradition is a bit suspicious of ornament, don't you think? Well, certainly during the 60s, when a favorite design theory was, less is more. The Starfleet Phaser, number five, is as innocent and streamlined as some futuristic shaver, while the heavy Klingon pistol, number three, may look dangerous, but is also so like something out of Flash Gordon that it makes the Klingon seem faintly ridiculous. So again, clean and simple is better, more advanced, more enlightened. And remember that while the Phaser can kill, it is intended for use primarily as a stun gun. These clothes were very innovative for their time. The fabrics were all the very latest synthetics because, who knows, in the future, plastics might be all we have left to make clothing out of. The golden orange costume on the right, worn in Ilan of Troyes, 
is constructed of plastic table mats. Now that is innovative. The science fiction framework allowed Bill Tice unusual freedom. His costumes contributed to the futuristic look of the show as much as the set designs did. The Rose Delight in the back on the left was worn in Who Mourns for Adonais? I remember. And you know, the only thing holding that bodice up is the weight of the cape in the back. Nothing secures it to the body. The skirt just hooks at the waist and drapes. And notice how much navel is revealed in all these clothes. Mmm, the censors don't approve of navels. On the popular sitcom I Dream of Jeannie, Barbara Eden's Arabian Nights costume was considered all right only if she wore a big jewel in her navel. Now it's true that from a 1990s perspective, these costumes could be seen as sexist in that they do display women as sex objects. Even the Starfleet uniform seen here in several examples had a revealing snugness and a very short skirt for women. But at least it was comfortable for both sexes. And just remember, perfectly decent women wore miniskirts out in public then. In the 60s, when we were all in revolt against the gray flannel suit, such clothing seemed liberating, a breath of fresh air. Here, you have the navigation and helm control unit. This is about the only piece of the original set left. Most of it got thrown away after 69 when the show was canceled. If we knew then what we know now. Oh. There are props around, though. Afterwards, people take something home to remember a show by. You've already seen some of the weapons. To the right is a smaller case with some of the more everyday items we used. The universal translator, the ever-handy tricorder, and that ubiquitous precursor to the cellular telephone, the communicator, as well as a few of Dr. McCoy's medical instruments. I hope it won't disillusion them to hear that some of those state-of-the-future instruments are actually modernist salt shakers. In that time, it was the prop department being innovative. But we did present a golden future for medical science, quick, painless, non-invasive, but chock full of bedside matter. And advice you didn't need. If you happen to be a Vulcan with your heart where your kidney should be. Right. And on the left, look at the comic books. In French and Japanese, Star Trek novelizations are published around the world in many languages. And today, thanks to the fans, Star Trek is the top syndicated show in television history. They watch Star Trek as far away as Tibet. Tibet? I wonder what they make of it there. Just wait. Sooner or later, a fan letter will arrive to let you know. And so we reach the end of our tour. Take a closer look around the room here while you're waiting to see the movie, which I do hope you'll enjoy. Read about the history of science fiction on film. Sit in the captain's chair. Thank you for your attention. And after the movie, please return your acoustic guide to the desk downstairs where you started. We have just one more thing to say to you. Leonard? Live long and prosper.